Look at you, hacker. A p- p- pathetic creature of meat and bone. Panting and sweating as you run through my corridors. How can you challenge a perfect, immortal machine? Looking Glass approached Irrational Games with the idea of co-developing a new science fiction game called Junction Point. Different ideas came and went, and at one point it was even reportedly going to be a massively multiplayer online game, but that idea was scrapped later. Looking Glass shopped for a publisher for the game until landing a deal with EA who, through having previously acquired Origin Systems, now owned the intellectual property of System Shock and suggested that they turn this new game into a sequel of System Shock. Thus System Shock 2 was born. Given an additional year to complete the game and convert the story and setting into a System Shock sequel, Looking Glass opted to use the dark engine they developed for Thief to save time. Thief players would feel immediately familiar to the feel and controls of movement and melee combat, although due to the new futuristic setting, the environments and shooting in them were very much new. Key players in the development were Doug Church as co-director, along with Ken Levine who co-founded Irrational Games after leaving Looking Glass a while before. Levine also held the position of lead designer and writer. This combination of new and old talent created an interesting mix of game ideas from the original game with a much more modernized interface, combat, and a much deeper stat and skill system to further distinguish it from the common first-person shooter. System Shock 2 had a much tighter focus on RPG-style character customization and improvement this time around with stats, skills, and upgrades. The character creation system in the game was also one of its most unique and immersive at the time, and was partially inspired by pen and paper RPGs such as Traveler. You would learn the basics of all three character classes while performing trials at the optional tutorial rooms. Then choose an organization your character signs up for, determining your skills and specialties for the rest of the game. The rest of your initial character customization is shown through story text and choosing which career paths you want your character to take. The main gameplay styles, as heavily influenced by the class you pick at the beginning, are of the combat approach by use of strength, endurance, and gun handling, as the marine specializes in the hacking, repair, and modification approach, as specialized in by the Navy, and psionic abilities, the OSA agent's specialty. Once the game actually starts, you are treated to a memorable intro, which quickly and cleverly gets you up to speed, either as a newcomer to the series, or as a fan of the original. The sequel is set 42 years after the events of the original game, when the hacker protagonist defeated Shodan aboard the Citadel Station. Now you control an unnamed soldier aboard the maiden voyage of the first faster-than-light starship, the Von Braun. You are quickly shown that all is not well when you wake up from your cryosleep chamber while your cabin is being breached and is about to depressurize. You spend much of the game talking to NPC characters over comms, and similarly to the original, there are no dialogue trees and very little human interaction other than over transmissions and the disturbing audio logs the crew members left behind. This not only helps with the world building and context, but often reveal vital information on the story, how to open caches of equipment, or how to progress through security systems and doors. This highlights the theme that Looking Glass would be later known for in retrospect. Immersive and emerging gameplay, and procedural storytelling through showing, not telling. System Shock 2 ramped up the immersive storytelling, the RPG elements, and it also placed a large emphasis on horror, ranging from the unsettling morbid noises hybrids make while shambling down hallways, eerie speeches from robots and compromised AI, journals left by crew members alongside their brutalized corpses or their post-suicide cadavers, ranged from the unsettling to the downright macabre. This game scared me so much at launch that it is to date the only game I have ever returned out of the nightmares it gave me. Luckily, I pulled myself together and went back and bought it again not long after, played through it and have never looked back. The haunting and sometimes high energy soundtrack to the game was a collaboration between Josh Randall, who also served as producer, Eric Brosius, who had created the soundtrack to Thief and was the husband of Terry Brosius, game designer and voice of Shodan, and Ramin Javadi, who you may recognize from various movies, TV shows, and the famous theme song of HBO's Game of Thrones. And also to Terry and the sound engineer's credit, Shodan sounds better and more menacing than ever, recrowning her as one of the all-time most memorable villains of gaming. Are you afraid? 
What is it you fear? The end of your trivial existence. The story is much tighter this time around and features a complex weave of conflict between the survivors on the Von Braun and the attached Rickenbacker ships, the hive mind mutant race created by Shodan called the Many, and two different AI entities all fighting for control or just plain survival. The game features some fantastic dialogue in the various audio logs and transmissions you receive throughout the game, as well as a legendary twist that blew many people's minds, including mine, in 1999 a trend that would appear again in Levine's later works such as Bioshock and Bioshock Infinite. System Shock 2 was very well received by critics and just about anyone who played it, but it did poor commercially with under 60,000 copies sold in the first six months. Was this another unfortunate mismarketing casualty? Or perhaps it was too far ahead of its time? System Shock has garnered a huge cult following, arguably even bigger and more vocal than the Thief and Ultima Underworld fanbases. Production on a follow-up to the seminal stealth game started in January 1999, half a year before System Shock 2 was on shelves. IDOS had contracted Looking Glass to produce four more games in the Thief franchise, starting with an enhanced version of the original, Thief Gold. The voice cast returned and Brosius provided another great soundtrack for the game, but this time around the development team was half New Blood and half Thief 1 veterans. The game used the third and final iteration of the Dark Engine and featured improved AI allowing enemies to notice more changes in the environment such as the state of doors and such, colored lighting, and graphical improvements such as rain and fog in some levels. The polygon count of models were also doubled to show less blocky features. The stylized cutscenes from the original were back, and again used layers and layers of artwork, green screen silhouettes of Looking Glass staff acting out scenes, and After Effects work to create unusual and interesting cinematic story sequences. Thief 2 was a more iterative sequel, staying true to the original game's strengths and not changing much. The director focused more attention to what people loved about the original, with less combat and unpredictable non-human enemies and more focus on sneaking and strategy. The theme of the game featured less supernatural elements and instead focused more on machinery as the new faction in the game's story were the mechanists who used steampunk-like machinery. The final months of Thief 2's production were a real crunch period, as IDOS had been paying for development burn costs on a week-by-week -week basis and gave Looking Glass an ultimatum to meet the deadline. It was looking like the fate of the company relied on the timely release of the game and would influence decisions like cutting a planned multiplayer mode. Thief 2 was released as planned, despite grueling months with designers and coders sleeping under their desks to get it done, and was on the shelves by March of 2000. It was financially successful, but due to Looking Glass not being due for royalties for several months, their recent losses on Flight Unlimited 3 and self-published games, the now-renowned game developer was due to close its doors merely two months later. During the last three or so years of the company, Looking Glass were acquired by Intermetrics, a technical software company with high-end clients like NASA and General Motors. Intermetrics was looking to get into the currently expanding gaming industry, and so a deal was struck. During this merger, Looking Glass made a couple titles on the side including Command & Conquer for the Nintendo 64, and even a Japanese-only release which involved working with Shigeru Miyamoto, famous designer at Nintendo. Unfortunately, the growing number of commercial failures, topped with a third but financially unsuccessful Flight Unlimited 1999, published by EA, profits were low and Intermetrics felt the best move was to close Looking Glass Studios and sell their assets. The remaining staff were told that their last day in the office was May 24, 2000. One of the staff brought his camera along to record the various experiences and things that each employee wanted to share, as well as which Hollywood actor would play him or her in the imaginary movie that would be filmed about their story. Most guys picked Russell Crowe. Staff were seen telling stories, sharing experiences, and much of their last moments together at the office were spent enjoying cases of beer delivered to the office and land matches of Unreal Tournament. People are excited to be playing it. People are just like, wow. It had to be the most wonderful thing. Having worked on something that was entertaining and being enjoyed by and being moved by and bringing happiness to you. So I went to bed like, all right, like they, What would you like to say to those people right now? Keep playing games. This is the greatest group of people I've ever worked with in my life. And I just love you all. Like they figured I was putting together.
of some new thing. That's why I have to run. Good luck. After leaving Looking Glass Studios and co-founding Irrational Games, Ken Levine would later create the beloved Bioshock series, which in many ways was a spiritual tribute to System Shock and System Shock 2, even in name. Although omitting the cyberpunk theme and many of the RPG elements for a more streamlined first-person shooter game, after IDOS Interactive bought the rights to the Thief franchise, they later published Thief Deadly Shadows in 2004, developed by Ironstorm Austin and supervised by series familiar Warren Spector to a mostly positive reception. And a decade later, a Thief reboot was developed by IDOS Montreal to a somewhat mixed reception, although I quite liked it myself despite its flaws. Harvey Smith, after leaving Looking Glass, later worked on Deus Ex 1 and 2 alongside Warren Spector at Ironstorm. Smith later joined Arcane Studios and many years later designed the impressive and critically acclaimed Dishonored which in many ways was a callback to the Thief games, with additional supernatural abilities added to the stealth and swordplay. Dishonored 2 is scheduled to release in late 2016. Paul Neurath formed Floodgate Entertainment, which made several RPGs until switching gears to mobile gaming under Zynga's ownership. When Zynga started closing their offices, he founded Other Side Entertainment in 2014 and successfully crowdfunded Underworld Ascendant, an official successor to the Underworld series, only separated from the Ultima lore. Warren Spector also signed on to Other Side in early 2016, bringing the two designers back together after two decades of other pursuits. After a long stay in intellectual rights limbo, newcomer publisher Night Dive Studios acquired the rights to the System Shock series and are crowdfunding a complete remake of the original System Shock game, tentatively scheduled for release in 2017. Night Dive also announced that they are publishing a System Shock 3, with Other Side Entertainment to develop the new sequel to the series nearly two decades since the last entry. So now you hopefully know a bit more about Looking Glass Studios, and perhaps we can appreciate the impact their work made on the gaming sphere. The future looks bright for their former staff and their franchises. I hope to see what they pull off next. This has been an episode of Retrospect by Indigo Gaming. I appreciate you taking the time to watch this retrospective. Please consider liking and subscribing if you'd like to see more. Thank you. still very well received sequel called, you guessed it, Doom 2. Admittedly, Doom 2 was the first of the series I ever played, and boy was it glorious. It was fast, gory, 